One of the scariest and most magnificent sights of recent years was the entry and detonation of the Chelyabinsk Superbolide over the southern Ural region of Russia on February 15, 2013. The word bolide is not well defined. It can have several different contextual meanings, but in short, it's basically a large, bright meteor that explodes, which can imply an object that may drop meteorites to the ground. A superbolide is a bigger version, typically defined to exceed 100 times the brightness of the full moon. The Chelyabinsk superbolide, in addition to causing at least 1,500 injuries, broken glass, and thousands of damaged buildings in the region, a real problem for that part of Russia in deep winter, also dropped meteorites. The meteorite is classed as a common LL5 type of chondrite. This would be typical material you might find in the inner solar system's asteroids and goes to show that some of the most common asteroid materials can pose an especially dangerous threat, even if buildings and people aren't physically hit by the falling meteorites. Chelyabinsk began as a roughly 20 meter wide near-Earth asteroid, albeit a small one. It entered the atmosphere at a brisk 42,690 miles per hour, or about 69,000 kilometers per hour. It briefly outshone the sun, and came in at a relatively shallow angle. It ultimately exploded in a meteor airburst, leaving behind a hot cloud of dust and gas. The Earth's atmosphere absorbed most of the energy, releasing a shock wave on the order of 500 kilotons yield or around 30 times the atomic bomb detonation at Hiroshima. This asteroid was not detected before it entered Earth's atmosphere, but not because we couldn't, but partly because it was coming in roughly from the direction of the Sun. Early on, there was a suggestion that the meteor might have been connected to a close approach of another known asteroid 16 hours after. But this is not the case, and the two showed very different trajectories. But it is known that the impactor is associated with the Apollo group of near-Earth asteroids. The Apollo group are a type of near-Earth asteroids that cross Earth's orbit. They are the largest class of near-Earth asteroid, with about 10,485 currently known. Most of the time they don't pose an immediate or even long-term threat. They've been here a long while, with only 1,648 identified as potentially hazardous. Chelyabinsk was not previously known, but was clearly hazardous. This drives home the problem of even small impacts over land on this planet. As an aside, Chelyabinsk also highlights the impacts that occur to asteroids themselves. Fragments of the meteorite were collected by people very soon after the impact, and indeed one chunk made a huge hole in a frozen over lake. Scientists were able to determine that the isotopic changes and shock since its formation, the asteroid had been impacted by at least eight major collisions with other asteroids, some early in its history, but even one as late as 27 million years ago. But impacts of this class on Earth are not rare. They happen relatively frequently but most of the time they occur over the oceans, which form a majority of Earth's surface area. Russia, however, forms a very large portion of Earth's landmass, which is why it sees impact events more frequently than other parts of the world. Another such impact occurred in 1947, but was of a very different nature than Chelyabinsk. On February 12, 1947, again with February, an enormous meteorite entered Earth's atmosphere and fell in the Sokoti Alin Mountains in southeastern Russia. This was not a stone meteorite, but an iron one. Iron meteorites are rare in the solar system, only making up about 5% of asteroids. But they're also sturdy and tend to more easily make it to the ground and falls. Here about 23 tons of material survived to the ground. And once again, eyewitnesses reported to have outshone the sun. It came in at a steeper angle, about 41 degrees and began to disintegrate early on, but did not detonate until it got closer to the ground and went off like a grenade airburst, spewing metal across a mountainside. This created two types of meteorite fragments, ones that are individually fusion-crusted and look like individual meteorite falls but aren't. They are fragments where their exterior melted high in the atmosphere. The other type is shrapnel from the airburst and exhibits torn and twisted forms, sometimes wildly so. The fall left a smoke trail in the atmosphere that was visible for several hours, and the fragments buried themselves up to 20 feet deep, while others embedded themselves into trees. Had this one fallen over a densely inhabited area, it would have been devastating and probably deadly. 
This asteroid probably had its origins in the asteroid belt and was probably knocked our way in a collision, and the iron asteroid before entry was something around 100,000 kilograms. Fragments of this meteorite were large enough to create impact craters, the largest about 26 meters across. As an iron meteorite, it's a fairly mundane composition containing mostly iron and nickel, but with rarer metals, such as traces of germanium and iridium. Going back further in time, however, we come across the largest recorded meteor event in history, though there are indications of others in unrecorded human history. This one was the famous Tunguska event of June 30th, 1908. Much has been written about this event, and to this day, explanations for it can get pretty far out there, such as a nuclear explosion or an exploding UFO. There's no reason to go that far, however. It was a natural event, and it was bad. Tunguska happened once again over a very sparsely populated area in Siberia and may even have caused at least three deaths. It happened in the morning, and the culprit, in a modern context, was very likely a chondritic asteroid, something perhaps like Chelyabinsk, only bigger. The asteroid was about 50 to 60 meters wide and came in from the southeast at an estimated 27 kilometers a second, or 60,000 miles per hour. It exploded at altitude, but relatively close at 5 to 10 kilometers, and laid waste to forest land over 2,000 square kilometers. This devastating blast, which famously knocked down trees wholesale like a volcanic explosion, came in at an estimated 12 megatons yield. There have been nuclear tests on Earth that yielded larger, but this would be among the top 10 if it were nuclear. But given that it was an airburst, no crater has ever been discovered. One long-standing hypothesis about the impactor was that it was a comet and might explain atmospheric disturbances in the days after the impact. However, samples of what seems to be vaporized meteorite and data from the Chelyabinsk fall point to a more stony or even a high iron meteorite. No parent body has been identified for the Tunguska event, and it was so long ago and under only visual observation that it's hard to track down. But there is one odd possibility here. There is an annual meteor shower known as the Beta Torrids. This is not typically a meteor shower that can be seen in the daytime at its peak, as its peak occurs after sunrise. But at peak, they can be observed using radar. They run from June 5th to July 8th. Tunguska was June 30th, so right in this time period, and came from the same area of the sky as this meteoroid stream's radiant. This is actually the same meteor stream as the more easily viewed Torrid meteor shower in October, and there are several potential asteroids associated with the stream, and this stream is known to produce periodic meteor storms, though that's not always guaranteed, and there have been hypotheses that the stream might be associated with larger materials rather than the dust that usually comprises most meteor showers. The next chance for a storm, and perhaps something larger, is slated for June of 2036. But it's not likely that there will be another Tunguska-level event, at least for a long while, as it is calculated to be a once-in-a-millennium event at the size that it was. Even still, if Tunguska happened today over a major city, the effects would be similar to a very large hydrogen bomb detonating over a populated area. The devastation would be almost total at ground zero, under the airburst, worse outside that, and then progressively less the further out. Loss of life and injuries would be comparable to a hydrogen bomb, and in an airburst, depending on the composition of the impactor, it may rain tiny droplets of vaporized iron over a relatively large area, along with lasting atmospheric effects that might be seen for days from particulate matter in the atmosphere. But it's also worth noting that to a Cretaceous period dinosaur, Tunguska was nothing. Little is known about the nature of the dinosaur killer, other than it was either a comet or an asteroid, and conflicting evidence so far has prevented a full identification. But we do know it left a crater in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and the impactor must have been on the order of 100 million megatons yield, leaving an iridium-rich layer known as the KT boundary where the iridium is out of place due to its rarity in the Earth's crust. It's a siderophile element that sunk down into the core with iron when the planet differentiated. What's interesting here is that this impact and the subsequent extinction of the dinosaurs was initially met with significant skepticism within the scientific community, and even with the mountain of evidence for an impact including the smoking gun and its aftermath, 
there are still some holdouts against the impact hypothesis. This goes to show that whenever a suggestion of magnitude is put forth, there is usually a large pushback against it until the evidence becomes overwhelming. You can expect this to be the case for any technosignature or biosignature put forth in astrobiology, and indeed that's happened. Few things more controversial in science of late has been the nature of the interstellar asteroid Oumuamua. But with the end Cretaceous impact event, there is yet another, newer, controversy. Notice the Tanis site in North Dakota. It's part of the Greater Hell Creek Formation that has yielded a huge amount of significant fossil discoveries from the Upper Cretaceous period. This particular site is just below the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, and it appears that this site preserves a snapshot of the exact moment, starting within a few minutes to a few hours after the impact itself in very precise detail. What seems to have happened here is that seismic waves from the impact arrived in the area about 10 minutes after it happened. This caused a series of waves in standing water up to several hundred feet high that rapidly crashed onto the shores of an interior seaway. The waves hit with great force in what was a riverway and creek complex and drove all sorts of animal and plant remains miles inland, along with tectites and debris from the impact itself. The result are some weird fossils, such as freshwater and saltwater animals jumbled all together in all orientations, along with microtectites actually in some of the gills of fossilized sturgeon, sucked in during their dying gasps as it were. There's even a turtle impaled on a stick. There are also microtectites identical to those found around the Yucatan, preserved in amber in this formation. There are even jumbles of feathers, thought to be from dinosaurs, along with severely mangled bones and even eggs. There have even been reported fossil anthills, clogged with debris, and even the remains of some early mammals inside burrows, and even mysterious pterosaurs known only from this site. Fish in a position associated with suffocation, and everything appearing to have died from the same thing at the same time. The site is, of course, controversial, and many scientists are skeptical and suggest that the site needs more interpretation, due to it being extraordinarily rare in the fossil record where you can trace something to a single event like this, which is fair enough, but given the evidence so far, if it's not from the impact, then some other cause other than the asteroid will have to be found to explain this very weird site. But in all of this, it pays to remember that even the dinosaur killer wasn't the biggest this planet has ever seen. It's seen many more over its billions of years of history, and one very much larger impact with a Mars-sized protoplanet is the currently favored mechanism for the origin of the moon, and it's overwhelmingly likely that this planet has not seen the end of asteroid and cometary impacts. Thanks for listening, I'm futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently eyeing the mammals suspiciously, including myself. We somehow survived the dinosaur killer impact and then went on to rule the planet, with some pushback from the birds, after an early history of being dinosaur food. It all seems too perfect, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.